data set. get started. Good afternoon. Hey, um, any, any questions before you get started on any of the homework problems or anything? I am going to go through I am going to go through one of the problems on not the categorical variables in the second homework. So any other general questions before we start? No, it's a categorical Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go through that fact fact a contingency table because I think that is kind of confusing initially. Okay, so what we want to do is we're going to continue on talking about quantitative variables. And so last time we were talking about kind of some of the basic aspects of quantitative variables. So we said we have a quantitative variable. And there, the first thing we noticed is that there's different ways to plot, different ways to organize quantitative uh, data. So one of the ways we talked about was a dot plot. And so Whenever you're looking at any sort of graph, you always want to make really sure you know what the x-axis and what the y-axis is, right? So in a dot plot, the x-axis is the value of the variable you're looking at. And all you're doing is you're just putting the data values on a number line. Maybe you see something like this. And that's a dot plot. The y-axis technically would be frequency, right? We usually don't even bother labeling it. And so this is really good for small data sets. But we said, okay, another way of looking at data is to say, well, we don't care about the individual values a great deal. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna chop up the range here into evenly spaced intervals. And we're gonna count the number in each interval and we're gonna plot that. It looks like a bar graph, but it's not. And this is the histogram. So this is where we're where we're binning data, right? So maybe this one might look like this. Something like that. And now the, the y-axis becomes either frequency or relative frequency, right? And the last way about plotting data is what we call a box plot. And in this sort of diagram, we're, we're still keeping the x-axis, but we don't have a y-axis. We're just basically showing where the, where the quartiles and the extreme values are. So here we might say, okay, this is the first quartile, maybe this is the third quartile, and our box plot looks maybe something like this. And maybe our medians here. So here we're, 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 we're actually purely looking at the location of the quartiles and the extreme values. Very different way. No, no y-axis, right? So three different ways of looking at it. But we said that usually what we're really interested in is we're interested in the histogram. Why? Because we want that nice smooth curve. So we want to try to fit this to some sort of curve. And once we know what that curve looks like later on, we're going to see that we can actually begin to compute probabilities and do inference and all that good stuff. So we start with the histogram, and there's some basic things that we want to describe, right? What were some of the things that we talked about with the histogram that we wanted to report? Anybody remember? No? We wanted to look at the shape, right? So we want to look at the shape, the number of modes, and whether there's outliers. So we said number of modes was one thing we wanted to look at. And the reason why is if we had more than one peak, that might be subpopulations, right? So we wanted to look at this because of subpopulation. Is that the one where you're looking for groupings as well to see if it had like two or more? Mm -hmm. okay. 
Okay. So if you have those two different humps, like when we looked at the drives, yeah. right, that might be two different subpopulations, and then you might want to know that. You might want to analyze them separately, right? So uh, we also might want to look at the presence of outliers. And these are important for a lot of reasons. They could be small subpopulations, right? So these could be subpopulations. They could be errors. Maybe somebody copied a number wrong, okay? Or they could be indicators of trends, which in finance is very often what they are. So we, we tend not to want to throw out the outliers. We tend to want to actually take them and look at them individually and try to understand what's, what's going on here, which of these three are they. Okay? And finally, we talked about shape. And so remember we talked about left skewed, this is when the tail is on the left, symmetric when it appears to have symmetry about some line, and then right skewed when it has a tail on the right. And we're going to talk today about why we care about the, 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 the shape, okay? The shape's going to actually be really important. So any questions on the basics of what we were doing here? Anything that's not clear yet we want to go over? All right, I better get moving before my before my my, my screen dies. Right. Uh, let's see if this is going to work. So one thing we want to do before we actually get into the details and everything is we want to start talking about the mean. And this didn't quite come out. This should be dot dot dot. Sorry, I don't know why it didn't come out on this on this, this computer. But the idea is we want to look at the mean first. So the mean is going to be the first measure of central tendency. So today we're going to talk about what it means to be the center of the data set. And we're going to have two different ways of computing the center. The first is the mean, which you know as the average, right? So the idea behind the mean is the mean is just the sum of all the data values divided by the number of data values, right? And you guys have been doing this, you know, since probably grade school, right? Pretty straightforward. And what I want to do is I want to introduce a little bit of notation for representing this sum. So it turns out that sometimes we want a general representation for how to write this. This should be x1 plus x2 plus, and then there should be three, three dots here. I'm not sure why it didn't show up. All the way down to xn. And we want to be able to represent that. So we introduce some, some notation. In fact, let me change this now. I'm not stop editing it. Okay. So anyhow, what I want to do is I want to write this, this right here. I want to write x1 plus x2 plus. And then I'm going to add arbitrary, arbitrary number of terms down to xn. I want a notation for that. Okay. And so what we do is we introduce this thing called sigma notation. So this is a sigma. It's a symbol that stands for capital S in the Greek alphabet. It's basically a set of instructions. It says, start from x1. I'm going to label all of, my, all of my data values. doesn't matter how we label them. I'll just pick up one, and I'll call that x sub 1. Pick another one, x sub 2. All the way down to the last one, we have n in our data set. The very last one would be x sub n. And this says, add up all of the xi's from x sub 1 sum them all the way up to x sub n. And that's just some notation we use. I'm not going to use that a lot, but the book uses it, okay? So the way we would write the mean is, on the one hand, we could write the mean like this, or I could use this nice compact sigma notation like this. And this means the same thing, okay? So here's kind of a problem that we have, though. We have to keep in mind that they're always thinking about two different means. On the one hand, you have a population. So this is our population. And I'm going to make a little table here, OK?
So in the one case, we have a population. And we have some variable x. And you remember what a parameter is. A parameter is just some number that's going to characterize this quantitative variable. So if you think about it for a second, that sounds very abstract, but if you think about it for a second, if you're talking about height, weight, IQ, whatever, what's the one number we use to characterize that property in the population? It's always the mean, right? So we're interested in the population mean. This is what we're interested in. This is what we want. But we can rarely get the population mean. Why? Because populations are huge. Not everyone's accessible. We can't make everyone, you know, necessarily, you know, respond or, or, or participate, okay? So we want this, but we can't always get it. And this population mean is what we call a parameter. In other words, this is a value that characterizes some property of the variable in the population. Okay. And we have a special notation for this. We use the letter mu. So let me kind of run you through this. So this is the notation, okay? It's not u, it's actually the Greek letter for m, so it's pronounced mu. <coughs> Notice that Notice that it, it starts with the first letter of the word mean, okay? So mu, mean, all right? It's the average over all the values in the population, so if I have capital N values, that would be the formula for it, right? And it's a parameter. It's some number. Right now, if I was an omniscient being, I could tell you the average height of all the Embry Little students, right? It's some actual fixed number, but I don't know. All right. So a thing to remember is that parameters go with populations. Okay? P and P. Okay? Parameters, population. All right. Parameters always have Greek letters associated with them. So one way to remember that, how many people know the phrase, it's all Greek to me? Has anyone ever heard that phrase? Yeah, what does that mean? It's all Jewish, I don't understand it, but there's a whole bunch of Exactly. Right, you don't, you don't know it. Well, you don't know the population means, right? This is, an this is an unknown number, so this is all Greek to you. You could think of it that way, okay? So parameters, things in the population, we don't know. They're all Greek to us, we use Greek letters for them. So that's one type of mean, okay? But, 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 but you know, what do we do? We don't give up. We can never know mu, but what do we do? We take a, a sample, right? So we take our sample here, and so we have a sample mean. And this is not what we want, but it's what we can get, and it's gonna be an estimate for the population mean, right? So the goal of this is that this is supposed to estimate mu, the population mean, okay? So this is, a, this is a statistic. Remember what a statistic is? It's something we compute from data. In this case, we're computing it from the sample data. It, it has the symbol of x with a bar over top. And this is pronounced x bar. Okay, so that's the sample mean. There's our notation, okay? It's the average over everything in our sample, so that would be the formula, small n now is a sample, and this is a statistic, and it's used to estimate. So the key things you wanna note are that, first of all, we have different symbols. <coughs> the population mean, we use this Greek letter mu. For the sample mean, we use x bar. The one is a, the one is a parameter, it's an actual fixed value that's unknown. The other is a statistic. It's a known number that varies from sample to sample. You can see how different they are, okay? 
And again, the whole purpose of the sample mean is it's supposed to estimate the population mean. And we're going to see that if we do a really good job, we can get about as close as we want. Okay, and we'll 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 talk about how to do that later on. So there's a, a, another type of, of average that comes into play. We're not going to use it a lot, but in finance, it's useful to know. This is the weighted average. And so here's just a really simple example. Your final grade for this class will be a weighted average, right? So these are the different items, right, that go into your grade, and these are the weights. And so the way Kansas computes this after it you know, drops everything appropriately is it calculates the percentage of points you got in each category. So this is a person that of all the homework points they had available, they got 80% of them. Okay. So the, the, the contribution to the final, the final grade is 0.375, because the homework has a weight of roughly 37%, and when you multiply those two, you get 30. Okay. And you do that for each of these categories, okay? you compute the, con the contribution, and then you just add them up. And so if we wanted to use our, our nifty little notation here that we have, Here's how, we, here's how we break the weighted average. It's the weight <coughs> times the percentage. Okay, so this is the weight times the percentage for each of these categories, starting from the first one, going up to, in this case, the fourth one. That's just the sum of these numbers. And if you do that, you do the math, you'll get 80.5. This person didn't do that hot because, why? Because they fell down on the exam, okay? This has a really large weight, even though they did really well on the activities, the weights are always great. Okay? So they ended up getting a roughly like this. So that's the weighted average. So any questions about averages right now? Everybody's good on this? Good. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is a second way of looking at the center. So we have an, another, another measure of the center that we call the median. So this is the first way of representing the center of the distribution. And the second is what we call the median. And so it turns out that the median is essentially, just like uh, we learned in the last class, it's the, it's the second quartile or the 50th percentile. Okay. Think of it like the median of a highway. It splits the data set into two parts, two equal parts, right? If we have an odd, uh, number of uh, data values, the median is literally the middle value. We have a middle value. If we have an even number of data values, notice we don't have a middle value. We have two middle values in a sense, right? And what would you do? The common sense thing would be just to average them, right? So that's how we're going to get the median. The thing we like about the median is that it's not affected by extreme values. So we're going to come back to this point. This is a very big advantage of the median. There is a notation for the median. We don't usually use it. This isn't really standard notation. The book uses small m. Some people use that, but we're not going to use that notation a lot. So let's go ahead and just compute uh, the median for a few simple examples. Okay. So at the top is the actual data set. Notice that in order to do the median, you have to order the data values first, right? So I can sort these and stat crunch or sort these in Excel from lowest to highest. I have five data values, an odd number, and so that middle data value, two, would be my median, all right? Now notice something. Notice that the mean's not equal to, to the median, right? I mean, if you go and you compute the uh, mean here, what would it be? So let's, let's suppose this is one from a sample, so we add up all the data values, right? We have five data values, so we get 20 over five or four. So that, that's the first thing we see, is that these things can be different. They don't necessarily have the same value. And that's gonna pose some problems, because if we have two things they can both supposedly measure what the quote-unquote center is, and they're not the same value, which one do you choose? So we're going to have to try to understand which one is, is, is the right value to use, okay? okay? This is an example for an even uh, uh, number of data values, right? Again, you would order them from lowest to highest, 
we have an even number, so we have these two middle values, 7.7 7 and 8.9, I take the average, that will be the median. Okay. And if you average 7.7 uh, 7 and 8.9, you'll get 8.3. Now notice I could compute the average by hand here, but I don't want to. It's really tedious, and that's why we're going to use stat crunch, okay? So we're going to see how to use stat crunch. We don't want to waste our time. We all, we all know arithmetic, we don't want to waste our time doing that. So let's, let's go ahead and, and, and try stat crunch. But before I do that, I, I want to kind of explain what it means to be the center first, okay? So this is a sort of example that happens a lot in real life. Let's just suppose that I am the owner of a uh, clothing manufacturer in some fictional country, and I have nine workers who work for me, and I pay them all $1, okay? And of course, I pay myself $991 an hour. Okay. Nice guy, okay? So what happens? <laughs> so what happens? Well, social media gets a hold of that, right? And they say, oh, that Brennan was a terrible guy, he's a sweatshop owner, he mistreats his workers and all this stuff, right? So you hear this sort of stuff on the news. And I come back, I say, no, no, you got it all wrong. The average salary for my workers are $100 an hour. That's better than any American wage class in any, any country. In fact, I'm a saint, I'm a hero. You should give me employer of the year award. Just the opposite. These people are out to get me, right? So, you know, you hear this sort of stuff with the fake news and all this stuff. So who is, who is right in this case? social media. But, but isn't the mean $100 an hour? And you take into consideration that he's being paid rather than the employment. I mean, am I, am I lying when I say that the mean's $100 an hour? You're not lying, you're misleading. I'm misleading, yeah. Well, well how am I misleading? That's the question. Yeah. You're in an ethical arena. So how? So you're kind of on the right track. So you're excluding your salary, not his salary. But I'm I'm a worker. I gotta go and make sure they're working. And <laughs> 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 you're using this as an assumption that people have that a worker isn't a boss. So you're adding the boss salary to the worker. So you get skewed the data when people make their assumptions. But see, all of these arguments, I can present a counter argument. I can say, well, the workers. In fact, I have the hardest job. I have to sit up all night thinking about what's going on and planning. I do a lot of research. I, you know, I work harder than anybody. So all of these things are, are really good ideas. And but you said something in the back. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. Oh no, I was talking. Okay, so look here. Let's just take a look. Let's 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 see what's going on statistically. Okay, why is you're absolutely right? It's misleading. The thing is why. So here's the actual data. I probably wouldn't show the data, right? But this is the data. And you compute the average, and sure enough, if you add them all up and divide by 10, you'll get $100 an hour. So I'm not lying. But why am I misleading? Okay, let's, but let's actually compute the median, too. The, the data values were already ordered, right? So the fifth and sixth data values are obviously 1. If I average 1, I'm probably going to get 1. So notice now I have two measures for the center of the data set, 1 and 100. Very different. So which one should I choose and why? Let's, let's take a look at the data. So if we plot the data using a dot plot, right? This, these are the $1 an hour. You can't even see the one because the scale is so big, right? There's nine values here. Here's my salary up there. And here's the mean and the median. Okay. Now the question is, we have it in our mind that the answer should be the median. That should be the center. The question is, why should that be the center? What does it mean to be the center of the data set? And it's a little tricky, because there's a lot of options, right? I mean, for example, I could take the, the a geometric midpoint, right? I could take the value halfway between 1 and 991. There's actually a lot of options for the center of the data set. Not just the median and the mean. There are others. But why is the median the best choice for the center of the data set? It's the set of outliers. So it's like with it does. The, um, box where you have the oh, the, the fences that takes out the stuff outside the fence. So the median we said that the median is kind of resistant to extreme values, and, and here's 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 kind of the basic idea. The basic idea is that 
what, what the center of the data set should be, so that it's not misleading, is it should be the, the value that most of the data values are centered around. Wouldn't that make sense to be the center of the data set? Okay. Not the center of the range, but the center of where the data is clustered around. And clearly, one in that, if by that metric, is the center. Because 90% aren't just centered, they're on that data value, right? So this is a much better measure of the center than 100, all right? So this is why, this is why the median is really the better measure for the center of the data set than 100. But we think in our minds, when someone says the mean, and we don't really understand the effect that outliers and other things can have, we tend to think that things are kind of clustered around the mean. But that's not necessarily the case. But when you have outliers, it definitely has the case. It has this really extreme effect. So we have to be careful about this. Any, any questions? So you hear a lot of times that statistics don't, don't lie, but liars use statistics. This is a situation where that sort of thing happens quite easily. So it happens not just with outliers, though. One of the reasons why we're interested in the shape is because the shape also affects where the center is. Notice that when you have a tail, the tail has the <coughs> same effect as an outlier. Okay, It's kind of drawing the data up to one side. And what's happening is it's drawing the mean out towards the tail, just like an outlier would. Okay? So when we have a left skew distribution, the mean generally is being pulled out towards the left. And again, you can see really clearly, this would not be a good measure for the center of the data set. It's coming out of the tail, right? So when we have skewed data, the median is a better measure for the center, okay? Same thing with right skew. The tail's in this direction, the mean's getting pulled in this direction, the median's gonna be a, a better measure for the center. And when it's symmetric, it doesn't matter. You can see really clearly that, that this is the median, right? 50% of the data on this side, 50% on this side, it's also the mean because you notice that for every value here, there's the same basic basic number of data values here. They average out as the, as the mean. Median. This is a little off topic, but you say that I mean we all know this is a skewed data. But how do you tell the data set is there is, and it's the only way that you know for sure is you have to look at the data. You have to really look at the data, and you have to know what you're doing. So kind of a classic example where this comes up in, in real life, this happened in real life. Um, how many people know who Scott Boros is? Nobody? No sports fan? Scott, Scott Boros is a big time sports agent, okay? He's the guy who negotiates these multi-million dollar contracts for athletes. When he came into baseball, the, the salary started to begin to look like this, okay? Free agency came up like in the early 1980s and free agency kicked in. When free agency happened, what occurred? Well, now people could bid on players, right, a lot more. So capitalism kicked in, and capitalism kicked in, and said that the consequence, whether you like it or not, things become more and more right skewed when it comes to income. So this is what happened. The incomes look like this. And the owners didn't quite catch up. They weren't quite up, up, up to this, so they got fooled. What, what, what Scott Morris would do is he would come to the agents, he'd have like a, he'd have like a shortstop, kind of like an average player, and say, well, you know, look at my stats. My player is average. This is the average salary. This is what my player should get. And for about a year or two, he actually got away with that. And then I think the Yankees and the Orioles and maybe the Pirates, I think, caught on the second year. And what happened by the third year is when he came back and he said, you know, I have an average player, they'd say, you know what, you're right, you do. And this is the actual middle of the data set, not this. And so your player's going to get this. And then he didn't get this too much. But so how would they know? You have to look at the data. And that's why plotting is so important. That's why we plot and then we, and then we describe. Okay. So anyhow, you have to be, kind of be careful about these things. So let's just kind of work through a hypothetical here. So one of the things that happens, again, you know, it's not just incomes that are, are skewed. Um, goods are often skewed too. So if you look at residential home prices, they tend to be very highly right skewed. Okay, so this is the selling price of a home. And in residential neighborhoods, they tend to have distributions that look kind of like this. The relative frequency, right? And if you think about your own neighborhood, you know that's true, right? 
most of the homes, at least in my neighborhood, were kind of about the same. There's always a small subset of homes that are really nice, okay? And that's that tail. So again, you know, we think about the mean and the median. So the median is going to be here. The mean will be here. And the question is, which do you use and when, okay? And this is a good question that you ask, how would you know? Because you have to think about who you're, who you're talking to, okay? So here's a hypothetical. Suppose you're interested in a certain house. And the real estate agent is trying to get you to buy the house. What statistic are they going to quote? Are they going to tell you the median home price in the neighborhood, or are they going to tell you the mean home price in the neighborhood? Which one do you think that they'll, that they'll use? The mean. The mean. The mean. Why? It's higher. And so what would the effect be? Why would they want to tell you the higher value? You think you're getting a good deal? think you're getting a good deal. Now, no, now, let me ask you a question. Suppose that same real estate dealer, I'm the same real estate dealer, and you're, and you're buying and you're selling. I'm going to tell you the mean. If you're selling, what do you think I'm going to tell you if you're, the, if you're the seller? Am I going to tell you the median or the mean? Right. Because I want you to think you're selling your home above market price, and you're, you're doing really well. So notice the same person can use the same data and talk to two different people. So a lot of times you have to ask yourself, does that person have an agenda? You know, the only way you know for sure is if you actually look at the table. Wouldn't they want to, even if they were selling it, wouldn't they want to tell you the mean? Because either way, they work off of a percentage, right? Um, the more it sells for, the more it's bought for. They have to get a percent. They're always trying to maximize their profit, but if they tell you the mean, chances are your home's going to be. Um, chances are your home is going to be. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. If you're talking, about, are you talking about the seller or the or the buyer? The seller. Okay, the seller. Okay, so you know, chances are your home really is going to be around here. If they tell you the average home is down here, chances are your selling price is below there, and you're going to look around and say, yeah, yeah. my house is like average. Why am I getting below average? And then you're going to think I don't have a good person, and you're going to try to up your price, and then you're not going to be able to sell your house. You're going to be sitting on your house. So these sorts of things you have to kind of think about. Okay, they're they're not they're not so obvious all the time. Um, what if you were um, having your, your, your tax assessed, okay? Uh, what would you want City Hall to, to use to assess your tax? Would, they, would you want your, your taxes to be assessed on the median or the, or the mean? The median. The median, because you're, you're paying on a lot. And that's a really artificial example. It doesn't work that way, but just so you kind of understand. Okay, good. So any questions about mean, median? So how do we know what to do? Okay, here's, here's kind of the general guidelines. Whenever we have outliers or strong skew, we always use the median. When we have a symmetric distribution, even though we could use the median, we use the mean, all right? Now, what happens in real life most of the time is that the two are not exactly equal, and sometimes it's not so obvious if it's symmetric. So we're gonna talk about what to do in those cases, okay? One way to kind of get around this problem in a very useful way is to literally trim the data set. In other words, order the data values, pick off the highest 10% uh, and the lowest 10% of the data values, recompute the median and the mean, and see if they're about the same. Uh, trimming the data set is a, is a really good thing to do a lot of times, okay? Um, for example, when I look at your student evaluations, okay, I trim the data set. Why? Because well, think about real life. What's going to happen? There's a certain percentage of people that really like you, and there's a certain percentage of people that really dislike you, okay? Because so it's a little bit of bias, right? So I trim the data set. I take out the, I take out the 10% of the highest scores, the 10% of the lowest scores, and then I'm looking at what 80% of the students think, which is actually what's important to me, the majority. Doesn't mean I throw away the other portion. I look at them, okay? Just because, you know, you may not like the lowest 10%, doesn't mean that's not valuable information. The most critical students may actually be the most observant. They may, be, they may, be, they may have the highest standards. But you still read it, you still look at it. But you know, in the end, when I want to see what's going on with the data, I usually take off the highest 10, the lowest 10. Part of the reason too, and you see this a lot when you look at like uh, ratings of, of products. Some people will look at ratings, and they'll say, oh, there's a whole lot of ones, or a whole lot of twos, okay? But one of the things that happens a lot of times is that the extreme values also distract you. People will see not even that many ones, but they'll see the ones. 
and now it makes them not want to buy it. When I look at your evaluations, if I see one person that says, like, I'm not enthusiastic, okay, that bothers me. Even though it's like 1% of the, of, the, of, the, of the data, nevertheless, you get ultimately distracted by that lot of this. So when you trim the data set, you can kind of see what's going on, okay? So that's kind of the idea. And we'll, we'll come back to this later. So why don't we take a real quick break. Um, go ahead and, and load up this data set, and we're going to come back and then see how to actually compute these things.
All good. Let's get rid of one. Okay. So why don't we bring it back up front? <laughs> and what I'm going to do now is we want to look at the distribution of car prices. So I took the data set that we had from last week and basically put down all the different makes that the catalog we saw. And we want to go ahead and plot the distribution of those uh, two different makes, okay? And then we want to see which center should we use, the mean or the median, all right? So first of all, let's go ahead and see how to compute the mean and the median for a data set, okay? You can do it by hand, but it, for really large data sets, it's kind of like sucking toes to a sponge. You know, you can do it, but it, it's really tedious, right? So um, go up to stats, because we're calculating a statistic, right? Up with the data. Click on summary stats and then columns. So once you have it loaded, stat, summary stat, column. All right? And what we want to do is um, we want to compute, we, well, we want to go ahead and we want to compute the mean and the median for um, uh, the price, okay? I think I have accidents. I, I was looking at other data sets, but go ahead and click on price. <coughs> I'll just, let's just do it from the, from the computer here. Okay. So I want to look at price. And I want to group the calculations by make. In other words, I want to compute the statistics for the different makes separately, okay? And now I'm going to choose the, the median and the mean. And I usually choose the sample size too, just because I like to see how many are in the sample. So I'm going to do this, then choose the mean, then scroll down, then choose the median. And then hit compute. Um, it's going to be a uh, price. Okay, so we want to look at the price, and then we're going to group it by name. How do I how do I choose those three things? What do I have to do? I click number one, and then what do I do? Hold, hold the control. Good. And then just click the other ones. Wait. Yeah. What's the end? I'm sorry. The end. Oh, the end's always a sample size. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna reserve that for sample size. And you should get a table that looks kind of like this. Okay. So let's, let's see how, how everyone's doing. Make sure that we're all, we're all good. Excellent. 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 Okay. Otherwise, what we'll have is you'll compute them all together. We'll have them separately. We'll be good. Is everybody good? Okay, so let me ask you a question. What what can we tell from these numbers? Can we can we tell anything? So you asked a really good question, like how do we know what's what? What can I tell from these numbers? Or what could I kind of guess is, is is going on, do you think? The price is more expensive or higher for Cadillac. Cadillacs are more expensive, right? Um, if I if I just look within the make though, okay, what can I say based on the two statistics, the mean and the median? What can I say about SOBs? SOB is probably symmetrical because they're pretty close together. The price is more consistent. Right. So the mean and the median for SOBs are really close, but we'd expect it. We probably have a symmetric distribution. So if I was going to draw the histogram for SOBs, it probably would look something like this. Something kind of symmetric, right? Because the mean and the median are really, are really, are really close to each other. That's what we think. What about Cadillac? What sort of distribution should I have? Should it be symmetric? 
It's going to be skewed how? To the right. Right. It's going to be skewed to the right because the mean, the mean is higher, right? So we can <coughs> analyze probably look like this. And they're going to have this long tail. So this will be the mean. This will be the median. Okay. That's what we that's what we expect. So let's go ahead and verify that. Let's go ahead and plot them. So we're going to do the plot. We'll go into graph and histogram. And one thing you notice that's really nice is there's kind of like a, a similar sort of form that commands have, right? I'm going to choose plot. Um, I'm going to plot the price. And then I'm going to group by make. Because I want to plot separate histograms. I literally want to make this plot right here. So I'm going to group the histograms by make. Okay. So we'll choose price. Group by make. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do relative frequency just like before. And the really cool thing about relative frequency, in addition to the fact that it, it lets us do a lot of things, one of the really nice things that also lets us compare the two distributions, if they have really unequal sample sizes, when you're looking at the relative frequency, they're on the same scale, the same, the same Y scale. Okay. I'm going to choose the mean and the median. And, and, and now we're going to be kind of careful. So this is where you want to really pay attention. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to say two rows per page at the bottom. And what that's going to do is that's going to create two rows. And let me plot them on the same page, okay? So I'm going to click on two rows here. And I'm also going to click on the use the same x-axis. And that way they'll be on the same axis and I can compare them directly, okay? So this will put them on the same plot and they'll have the same axes. And what last thing do we have to do? Title. We got, we got to do the labels, right? So what's on the what's on the x-axis? What's the label for the x-axis? Price. Price. Okay. Usually not a bad idea when you do finance to say the units, okay? I mean, um, some sometimes Americans are a little are a little arrogant. We think everyone speaks English, everyone uses dollars, but the zero strength marks, right? So USD is not bad. The y-axis is just going to be relative frequency, right? And finally, we can go ahead and just, uh, we're just going to say that we're going to compare the two price distributions, right? Oops. Something like that. Okay. And hit compute. And the graph will initially be kind of scrunched, so you just kind of pull it over a little bit. And it looks like that. Okay. You see how it's going? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, that's nice. So think about what's going on. It, it, does the plot kind of correspond with what we thought? Yeah. Good, good thing? Yeah. Everything good so far? So you're going to say price, and then you want to group by make, just like you did with your calculation. Okay. Okay. You can click on relative frequency. And then click the mean and the median. Is your computer dying? No. Oh, OK. Just want to make sure. OK. Do you guys want to work together? We kind of work, we kind of help each other out. So explain why your graph is, is different. But what happened to it? <laughs> Looks good, looks good. Okay, that should look really good. So if you if you want to two, if you go back there. And you say two rows per page. And you put them in the same plot. Looks good, excellent, excellent. Yeah. So so that's an excellent question. So what is what are the red and the and the green lines? Uh, <laughs> Right, and you actually know that the green is the mean y because it's pulled out towards the tail, right? So notice that this that this plot looks very much like what we expected. So how would we describe this plot? Your you know your boss comes to you and says, "Hey, you looked at that Saab Cadillac data. What did it look like? How do, how do we describe the Cadillac distribution?" Okay. 
What else do we want to report? So we want to report the skew, right? So we say it's right skewed. What else do we want to report? Um, I want to report the center. So that's, that's a good point. What is, the, what is the center here? Is the center the mean or the median? Which one should I use? Median. I'm going to use the median because I have a skew, right? So I'd say the median is about... And you can report the exact value. Usually I kind of round things off if the numbers aren't too difficult to round off. So like here the median for the Cadillacs is, you know, roughly about, you know, 38,500, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, what else do we want to report on? A couple more things. Number of modes, right? So we'd say this is going to be unimodal. We gotta think, we gotta stop for a second. Is it really unimodal? Could it be something else? It couldn't possibly be bimodal, <coughs> right? So there's there's a little question with this blip out here. Is this a, is this a tail or not? What what might cause it to be bimodal? What do you think? Are all Cadillacs the same? No. Nope. So it could be one higher end versus a lower end? Yep. Could be totally different models. There's definitely a wide range, right? The Cadillacs depend on the models. So we, we actually might want to go back if we want to be really careful and look at this and see if maybe when we plot the Cadillacs with respect to models, we don't get this kind of distribution, okay? But for right now, we'll say it's, 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 it's unimodal. And what's the last thing we want to, we want to discuss? It's, we said it's the most important thing in data set. Outliers, right? So we'd say there are no apparent outliers here. Does everybody agree? Everyone good on this? Okay. Okay, so someone take me through the SOB similarly. Go ahead, take me through the SOB. How would you describe this, this, this data? Wait, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I thought the fact that it does have a tail means there are outliers. So that's a, that's a good point. So what, what is an outlier? How would it manifest when we plotted the data? Anyone want to? <clears throat> there be no data connection. Maybe. So because it has like a trail that leads out to it, it makes it like connected to more of the gap. It's like more of a gap between the out and the last one of the other ones. It's even like okay. Is this because we have more of a sheet? And so you guys were all kind of saying the same thing, which is, and here, here, here's how we think about it. The outlier is an outcast. So if there's an outcast, it'd be a gap. So here's, here's, here's what an outlier would look like. An outlier would look like a, like a data value way out here. But it would be cut off from the rest of the population. And the way it's, it, it, it manifests itself is you're going to generally see a big gap. Okay. So if you had a gold-plated you know, um, Cadillac, okay, it might be way out here. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be with the rest of them, all right? Uh, again, but Again, though, if we're looking at around 40, and then the last one's around pretty close to 80,000, would that not be a, a gap, therefore an outlier? No, there's, there's not, no, there's I'm not no, trying to be an ass here. No, 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 no. I mean, th those are extreme values, but here's the thing, remember what we're trying to do, is we're trying to fit this to a curve. So what we're, what, we're, what we're saying is we're saying that, it's a little hard to draw in here, but what we're saying is the curve kind of looks like this. It has a long tail, and those values are part of the long tail. But it's part of that, it's part of that distribution, okay? So it kind, of looks, it kind of looks continuous. It looks like it's all under the same curve. But then if you had a data value really separated, it comes from a different population, you would be saying. So just because you have values way out in the tail, extreme values, that, that's inherent in the distribution. The distribution saying that it has this really long tail, and these are just part of that long, long tail. But they're still part of that distribution. Okay? Does that answer your question? Uh, honestly, it doesn't make sense yet, but I think we're starting to hold. Okay, think about it some more and, and see. Sometimes it's just kind of like formulating the question. You know, what, what is it you're looking for? What is it that's just bothering you, right? Okay, so go ahead. You're going to take us to the side now. How, how, do, how do we describe the SOB plot? It'd be unimodal. It'd be unimodal, yeah. No set outliers. No, no, no apparent outliers. And the absence of a symmetric outlier. 
is symmetric, I agree. And what should we use, the mean or the median here? We're going to use the mean, right? We could use the median, but when it's symmetric, we're going to use the mean. So we say that the mean is roughly about, you know, 29,500. And that would be the two descriptions. Okay. Good job. Any, any questions on this now? We're all good on descriptions. And we're going to talk about the center. The center is the one thing we haven't talked about yet. Okay. So here's kind of a question to think about. You might say, well, the median is always the safe choice. Why don't we just always use the median? I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of weird. Everybody in this room knew what the average was before this class started, no doubt. But probably not everyone knew what the median was. But if the median is always the right answer, why do we even talk about the mean? So here's what we saw. The mean is really sensitive to the, to the, to the distribution. It's sensitive to the skew part, and it's sensitive to the outliers, OK? It's very sensitive to the nature of the distribution. And what is our goal? Very often we want to compare two distributions, right? I want to see if they're the same or different. So I actually want something that's sensitive. Kind of like when the miners go down the mine, they used to take a canary with them, right? The canaries are really sensitive to, 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 to dangerous chemicals, right? They would tell you right away if there's a dangerous chemical. The same thing here. Because the mean is so sensitive to changes, it's going to be able to tell if the two distributions are the same. So that sensitivity is going to come into play later on. So if you see a set of data that someone properly took and you could see that they're using the mean, it's a good, there's a good chance that it's a very even spread of data, like symmetric? If, if, someone's, if someone is using data and they're giving the mean, then it should be symmetric if they're doing that, you, you would assume. But you asked a really good question, which is how do you know which is correct, the mean or the median? Kind of the simple answer is you generally have to know the distribution. When you work in finance after a while, you're very used to the fact that income's a right skew. So when someone gives you the mean, you know almost automatically, hey, hold on, you know, that's what not what we should be talking about. So things tend to have certain types of distribution. Prices of goods tend to be right skewed, homes tend to be right skewed, incomes tend to be right skewed, right? So again, Knowing which one to use kind of depends upon you knowing what, what the distribution is like. And if you don't know what the distribution is like, and there's lots of examples like this, you have to actually look at the data. Or you have to really trust the person. And the question is, who do you, who do you trust? So like I hear stuff all, all the time on the news. Do I believe stuff I hear on the radio? It depends on the source. If it's just a person like the US government doing statistics, or a really large company like, like Pew, or these really big research firms, I usually believe it. They might be wrong, but they're very reputable. They have a very high reliability rate. When it's an individual research group, I tend to not believe it. Or I have, I'm very skeptical. Because they, do, they generally don't reproduce their, their results. And it's very easy to get significant effects when you don't reproduce. Okay? So individual research groups, and you hear statistics all the time on the news, I tend to put really low weight. Things that come from really reputable sources that do a lot of statistics on an everyday basis, I tend to kind of have a little high regard for. So you kind of have to consider the source too. So most of the stuff that you hear in the news from research groups, you have to be very skeptical about. Okay. And there's lots of interesting stories that I, I won't go into. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and talk about the, the categorical variable um, problem. If, 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 you, if, you want to, if you want to read a good example of a person who, um, who, who did research that ended up being very wrong, but did everything right statistically, there was a woman by the name of Amy Cuddy. Uh, she used to be at Harvard. She's, she's now since, since the, uh, departed. And this is a really interesting. The New York Times has a really good article last December called uh, when the revolution came for me. And it kind of talks about what can go wrong with individual researchers. It's actually very, very interesting. She gave the second most highly watched TED Talk. And now she's like persona non grata. Very, very interesting. 
Okay, anyhow, I want to talk a little about, about categorical variables. And let's talk about two categorical two categorical variables. <coughs> and if you don't mind, I'm gonna actually work on this other board because it's this is kind of And let me kind of give you a really uh, simple scenario, okay, to kind of illustrate what's going on. So suppose we have two categorical variables. One is gender. So I have two values for gender, male and female. I'm talking about biological gender, okay? And um, suppose my second categorical variable is fear of preference, okay? So we like to tackle the really hard questions here. Uh, maybe light, regular, and dark field. And, and I, I take a survey of people. So I stop people, I look at their biological gender, I write that down, and I ask them, what sort of beer do you prefer? If they don't prefer any beer, I leave them out of the cup. So I'm looking at beer choices, okay? So this is beer preference, light, regular, dark. This is gender, male and female. And when I take all the data and I make my contingency table, here's what I see. Um, Let's see something that looks like this. Something that looks like that. So what is this? Um, so uh, how many how many men like regular beer? If you look at this table, can you tell me? What's that? Um, 30, right, 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 30. So 30, 30 men like regular beer. But I was actually thinking light initially, so you yeah. can see I'm, I'm lying to you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so 30, 30, 30 guys like regular beer. Okay, so we know how to read the table. So suppose I ask you a question. I want to ask you two questions. The first question is among men, what percentage prefer dark beer? How did you come to 60%? So why did we use, so we have we have 200 people total in the study. Why didn't we divide 60 by 200? What made you divide by 100? Right, among men, right? So that's telling me, that's kind of like code word for focus on just the men in this, in this data set, right? So when I focus on the men, I have 100 men total. And if I look at the row percentages, this is gonna be 60%. So 60% of men prefer dark, 30% regular. Okay? Good. Easy one. What if I ask you, is there an association or is there a relationship? Does this table show if there's an association or a relationship here between gender and beer preference? Men are pickier about their beer? Or more, or, How do you more, get or, or more biased towards dark because if you see a very even spread maybe they don't really care about what what kind of beer they're drinking but then you see 60 percent of men prefer dark beer maybe they're more biased towards that so that's a kind of that's a kind of a good way of putting it so when we're talking about association association means that something goes with something more often so if people say that i'm associated with the underworld well what does that mean that means that i tend to i tend to go with the underworld more than not, right? So this is what you're seeing. You're seeing that men go with dark beer more than women, because if you look at the women, only 30% prefer dark beer, okay? So make sure to bring your laptop, okay? We're gonna need that. All right, thanks.